Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. You know, I make a lot of mistakes, but hopefully we can correct some of them. For example, uh, we didn't sing happy birthday to Kate. And we're going to sing happy birthday. 90 years old. 90 years old. Uh, that's just amazing, isn't it? Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kate. Happy birthday to you. Long shall you live. The other thing that we need to do today is to recognize, because the passages in Scripture don't really fit that, that this is Reformation Sunday. And you only can understand Reformation Sunday if you look at one word that is so important in the history of our country and is so important in the history and in the lives that we have here in our congregation. And that's the word freedom. Freedom comes up again and again and again because that's really what the Reformation was about. Freedom. And it's important for us to understand that because you and I are so easily led aside and led into the wrong direction. And the wrong direction is to think that what we do provides the freedom when we know right from the top of the text that there is something different going on when we as the people of God celebrate. And that is Jesus, the son of death, have mercy on me. I think that's wrong. That's, that's last week. I preached on that last week. Okay, let's put that away. Somebody give me a bulletin. Thank you, dear. What would I do without you? Thank you. Now, oh, she came up with a few things. <laughs> so the bulletin really lets us know that the only freedom that we have is the real freedom that comes from this knowing the Son of God, Jesus our Lord. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let me point it out again. It's our temptation to think that we as a country or as a people can provide freedom for one another. The reality is that only the Son can set us free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together in your name. Help us to recognize one another as your children and help us to know that you are here with us and for us and in us. In your name we pray. Amen. How many of you have heard the expression uh, close but no cigar. Everybody who has heard that expression. Okay, what does it mean? What does the expression mean? You heard it, but you had no interest in finding out what it meant? What does it mean? Somebody. You didn't win a cigar? Why? It used to be that cigars were given out by circus personnel, for people who were uh, coming to a circus and playing the games, like the fair here in, in Bucyrus. Close but no cigar. Remember that for a moment. Because in a very real sense, that's what we're going to be struggling with in this 12th chapter of Mark, where Jesus is being confronted by a scribe, and the scribe himself asks Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And he goes on to tell him that the greatest commandment is the one that was read in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6. What's the great commandment? The great commandment is for us to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and Jesus adds, with our minds. What is going on? The scribe says, well done. Can you imagine saying to Jesus, well done? 
How many times have you said to Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus, but uh, you didn't quite, you know, meet, get up to par here. But Jesus acknowledges him, but then he comes up with this strange statement, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What more could this man have done? What more can he have done than to say that God is to be loved with all of our heart and with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind? What's Jesus saying to this poor man? You're not enough. What you've done isn't enough. Too bad, come back some other day. Maybe we can get you a cheaper cigar. No. What is Jesus trying to say? Well, let's look at it a little bit more deeply. Because it's so important for us to understand that. What Jesus is, is quoting is what we read in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6. That's where the word Shema comes from. Because the word Shema is the first word of the statement that every Jew in the beginning of the day and in the end of the day makes. It's the word for here. And Jesus is using this word for purpose that you and I need to also look at for ourselves. You see, the Jewish people, as quoted by Jesus, start off with here, here. And then it goes on to say, here with all of your mind. In other words, there is no short way, shortcut. Jesus himself quotes the Shema, which starts off by saying, hear. But what's interesting about the word hear is that in more, almost all languages, and especially in Hebrew, the word hear is the word for listen. And what do we say to our children? And what do our children say to us? Listen. Obey. You see, the center of the Shema, the center of what Jesus is saying, is that you and I need to obey. It's not enough to know the words. It's not enough to know that Jesus Christ has quoted them. That's important too. But what's really important is for you and for me to recognize that we need to listen. Well, let me put it in another way that I think stuck with me because it is such an important concept. And that is love of God without obedience, listening, is no love at all. Love of God without knowing that we're going to obey is no love at all. And that's what this particular text is saying. He's saying, you see, you're not going to get a cigar here. You're not going to measure up to what's important because what you need to know is not just know something. You need to obey. We need to, as the people of God, obey. And it comes up in, again and again and again. The 14th chapter, for instance, of John let me read part of it. The 14th chapter of John lays it out quite well. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Let me stop there for a second. The way the word commandment is used here is not like thou shall, thou shall, thou shall, but a charge. Jesus is giving, the people of God are given a charge that they should carry out. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone may lay down his life. You see, love means nothing unless there's obedience in it. Unless we, you and I, understand that it's not a matter of doing whatever we want, but it's a matter of obeying our Lord as our Savior. So, Shema is the Hebrew word for listen. And the Lord is one. No other loyalty shall be countenanced 
by the people of God. Our loyalty is with a God who is one, not many, not different ones, but one God who is our Lord and Savior. I wrote down a portion. If we truly want to understand what this means, we should turn to 1 John. If you have a Bible with you, incidentally, we should start bringing the Bible. As Lutherans who are in the Reformed tradition, it's impossible for us to really worship without the Word of God. No, it doesn't have to be in a book. It can be in an insert. It can be in various forms. But our Bible should be at our right hand as much as possible. And so in 1 John, we read, as soon as we get there, chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, God himself wants to be present in our lives. And he also knows that nothing that we can do will be able to eradicate the sinfulness and brokenness in our lives. But he also knows that we can't do it on our own, that we can only do it through the power of God. We love because he first loved us. This is not an impossible commandment an impossible charge? No, because God has promised that he first loved you and he first loved me. And that's why we're able to celebrate Reformation and the Shema. Hear, O Lord, the Lord is one. Can you say that with me? Hear the Lord, the Lord is one. One more time. Hear the Lord, the Lord is one. One, and he gets the loyalty. Amen.